uh, we can move on to um, Dr. Lauren Ring and Dr. Suzanne Watnick's uh, combined talk. I'll let you take it over. Okay, Lauren, you're going to head kick it off and I'm going to bring up um, the presentation. So hold on one second. Awesome. And I will preface this while we're pulling up the slides that um, Dr. Watnick and I really hope that this will be a, um, a, um, a presentation that generates a lot of discussion. So we hope that we can engage uh, a lot of you guys in this. So um, hopefully we'll be there. So um, our, our topic, as you can see, is fear and loathing and dialysis, a psychedelic trip from Ohio to the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about kind of how we got here. Our objectives, of course, is to talk about um, this court case, Supreme Court case from over the summer, Marietta versus uh, DeVita. Talk a little bit about how we pay for dialysis, what the implications are of the decision, and then how do we fix it? Um, or so, you me when you want me to change slides. Yeah, next, so next slide. So a lot of you are going to be wondering, I mean, how did we get to this topic? Because most grand round topics are you know, chosen in the way that a ball's fantastic grand rounds was. You have a patient, you see them in clinic, you have an interesting you know, question that comes up, you think about it, you read about it, you say, I need to teach people. And I would love to pretend that's the origin of, of how I got interested in this topic, but uh, rather it was, uh, I was on the uh, much beloved and maligned app, uh, Twitter, over the summer, and I came across this tweet from epidemiologist Eric Weinhandel, which talked about this uh, Supreme Court case with DeVita, and I was like, huh, what's this? I didn't even know there was a Supreme Court case, and so, um, I, you know, I'm plugged into Neff Twitter. I said, I'm going to get answers pretty soon, and, and, you know, I'll know what's going on. And there wasn't any. Um, and if you even look, so I just screenshotted this uh, tweet from uh, just pretty recently in the last week or so. And you can see just at the bottom, the number of retweets and likes and even the comments was very low for what seemed like it was a big, uh, a big topic, an important topic. So I figured, you know, if Twitter is not going to give me the answer, uh, I should ask the people around me. And so, you know, I started bugging all of the really bright and, and brilliant colleagues that I see and said, hey, you know, what do you think of this topic? What do you think it means? And the, the responses were very varied. I had some folks who were, I mean, brilliant who said, I don't really know. That was probably the most common response. Um, some people said, hey, you know, we have Medicare that covers dialysis, so I don't really care. I said, okay. And then, you know, I was at this conference for home dialysis um, uh, over the fall, which was a really fantastic conference. And they had this um, speaker talk to us about the economics of home dialysis. And so I said, this is perfect. This is someone who's going to know exactly, you know, what, what this means. And so I asked them and they said, well, something along the lines of this decision has to be overturned. Otherwise, you know, outpatient dialysis isn't going to be feasible. And I said, well, <laughs> that sounds big. But I couldn't really get any answer. And so, you know, part of me was like, I don't know how big of a deal this is or not big of a deal this is. And I wasn't sure how much to, to explore it. And then there, there was a, just a brief perspective piece in Jason uh, this October, which just talked a little bit about the implications. And so I said, you know, this seems like there's something there. If no one's gonna tell me what's going on, I need to read the Supreme Court decision. And so I did. And it seemed like a really big deal. I said, why is nobody talking to this? And so I reached out to uh, who I thought would be our resident expert and was really expecting just to get uh, uh, a few comments on their thoughts. And so next page, next slide. I talked to Suzanne Watnick. And so while I was saying, Suzanne, I haven't heard anything about this. What do you think? She was like, everyone is talking about it all the time in my circles. And it was really interesting because at that moment, I thought that I was an engaged, plugged in nephrology fellow who, you know, would get the information that I needed, right? I looked at all the places that I knew to look. I asked the people that I knew who were smart. I was reading PubMed. I even scanned the ASN, like daily emails we get for different topics. And I couldn't find anything. And then here, you know, in a whole different world, you know, Suzanne was talking about this and engaged on it on a higher level. And it it made me reflect that, you know, 
you know, sometimes I've struggled with patients who come in and think they know everything um, and they'll be very vaccine hesitant or, or seems like they've done their research and we come at this impasse. And I started to realize that they're probably doing the same thing that I was doing, getting all the information where they normally get it from, talking and, and thinking that they're really knowledgeable, not realizing that there's a whole nother you know, conversation going on. And so I think it was really, really interesting how much your perspective is affected by the silo that you're in. And so just to get a sense of, of what silo this group is in, I have a poll. So next page, this is not a validated question, um, but just to get a general sense of what the audience knows about this uh, decision, um, there's four different options. So if we can launch the poll. Um, they, they kind of range from, I am hearing about this, this court decision now, or you can include yourself if you've only heard about this court decision because I've bugged you about it. That would be a good one too. Maybe you're a little familiar too. There may be some people here who are super familiar and say, Lauren, stop talking, let me do it. So um, we'll give people just a, a couple of moments to, to answer. Looks like we're e reaching an equilibrium here. Okay, perfect. Let's get to the results. Yeah. This is interesting, right? I mean, it seems like the vast majority of people, if I'm just eyeballing it, you know, 70 something percent of people don't know a lot about it. And that's not, you know, that shocking to me because I was someone who really wanted to, to know about it myself. Um, but uh, I didn't have the information. So hopefully we can change this today. So um, next slide. Hi. <laughs> no worries. So, um, you know, before we go on, I just want to talk about, you know, what was my basic understanding of the case before really digging into this? And so kind of what, what I had heard was that, you know, there's this, Hospital in Georgia, the Mar Marietta Memorial Hospital had an employee health benefit plan that had no in-network outpatient dialysis providers and for um, had very limited reimbursement rates for, for the outpatient dialysis, essentially being a benefit that didn't cover uh, outpatient dialysis. And so in 2018, Davida sued saying that this basically differentiated between patients with, with end-stage kidney disease and those without. Um, and the Supreme Court sided with Marietta. And so for me, it seemed like, gosh, hey, this is a Supreme Court. This was, you know, uh, decided in uh, this past summer. I was like, this is a conservative Supreme Court. This decision was released a couple days before Dobbs. They're just making a decision that I don't like. Um, but, you know, I realized that you can't really understand uh, this case without digging a little further. And so um, this kind of takes us on a wild trip to understand, uh, you know, what, how dialysis is paid for and what, why this case is a little bit more complicated than it seems at first blush. So handing it over to Suzanne. So thanks, Lauren. And um, so we've got our psychedelic slide here because um, a lot of this, just some of it really is hard to uh, believe sometimes. Um, and so I wanna, I, I thought it might be worthwhile after having some conversation with Lauren to go back and talk about how we actually pay for maintenance dialysis in this country, first of all, current state, but then go back in history a little bit and then understand how we came to this point where this small hospital in Ohio, Marietta, Ohio, um, you know, with its employer-based um, plan um, ended up uh, coming up against DaVita and actually winning in court again, um, with regards to something called Medicare, a secondary payer, which um, you know was already legislated, and this really overturned a major decision. So you know, maintenance dialysis, as we all know, was introduced uh, back in '60s, um, and we're still puzzling how to pay for it. So um, this is some data from the USRDS uh, from this year, which looks back. You know, it's always a lot of delay in terms of data. So this is reporting back at the end of 2020, and um, looking at prevalent maintenance dialysis patients on on dialysis in this country. And I just wanna point out that, um, you know, 30 plus percent of patients are Medicare only patients, 20 plus percent are Medicare, when I say duals, I mean Medicare plus Medicaid as, as their secondary to pick things up. 
Um, and the Medicare only, by the way, is Medicare fee for service. The Medicare as secondary payer is those who have Medicare as their secondary payer, of course, and Medicare Advantage is those who would have been in Medicare fee for service, but chose to be in a Medicare Advantage plan. And um, as of 2021, so not in this data, but as of 2021, prevalent dialysis patients could actually choose to be in Medicare Advantage plans, but could not in the 2020 period. So you'll see, but those who were already in a plan could continue. So you'll see after 2020 that this 18.9% portion uh, really expands. I don't have that data from USRDS because it hasn't been published yet. It's the, the big uh, piece of the pie, the 20% over here, that is either commercial, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more in depth, or Medicaid, and those are reimbursed at very different levels. I have the pie about the incident patients, just to show you that people who are starting, there's much more patients in the non-Medicare bucket because a lot of people coming are coming in with commercial insurance, and they um, oftentimes lose that over the period of time where either they are no longer in a job um, after starting maintenance diet dialysis or um, their jobs, the commercial insurance are only covering for 30 months, which we'll talk about in another slide. This is a lot of lines, but the bottom line here is really what I wanna to demonstrate to all of you is that there are changes over time. This is just showing um, sources of how dialysis is paid for, for prevalent, um, maintenance dialysis patients, it says prevalence ER, ESRD, but these are actually pa patients um, uh, on maintenance dialysis or transplant, but it gives you a sense that Medicare Advantage increased over time. And yes, because Medicare Advantage didn't really exist to any appreciable degree um, back before 2010, and that's expanded. Um, and as you can see, the um, area that has de decreased is the Medicare only, the Medicare fee for service made up by Medicare Advantage. Um, so, you know, you might ask, what are these types of pay? Who are these types of payers? So, just going through each of these categories. Um, so, Medicare is the primary payer and they set a rate. So, Medicare only in those pieces of pie, Medicare fee for service is what patients on maintenance dialysis become eligible for from essentially the very first day if they're on home dialysis. That is not the case if they're on in-center hemodialysis. Um, that takes uh, 90 days. So it takes three months for people to become eligible for Medicare fee-for-service in the um, Medicare benefit uh, for uh, maintenance dialysis. The Medicare duels, as I mentioned before, is Medicare fee-for-service paying a dialysis provider and they pay 80%. And so what's left over for that 20%, if a state's Medicaid program um, pays as much as Medicare, they will kick in and pay that 20%. But if Medicaid rates are 80% or less of what Medicare is, they will not pay anything more to a dialysis organization. So a lot of times for patients who are duals, um, a dialysis organization will only get paid 80% of that Medicare fee-for-service um, rate, just giving you a sense there. Medicare is secondary payer. There was legislation before the Marietta ruling, and this is one of the major things that Marietta um, has potentially uh, muddled with. The Medicare secondary payer is actually um, put in, was put into effect and kicks in thir after 30 months of a commercial in insurer paying for dialysis. So let's say you're employed and you get employer-based insurance and those commercial rates are paid to a dialysis organization, those commercial insurers are only required to pay for 30 months. So you have your 90 days initially where people um, have their, their payments kicking in and then 30 months. So for 33 months, you'll typically have commercial insurers paying and then all of a sudden the dialysis organization will get paid Medicare rates, which may go from you know, $1,200 per treatment down to $290 per treatment. We'll go into the dollars in, a, in the next couple of slides. Medicare Advantage um, is an alternative. So Medicare beneficiaries can choose to continue with Medicare fee-for-service when they're Medicare eligible, 
or they can choose a Medicare Advantage plans. And Medicare Advantage, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Well, Medicare Advantage offers some things that Medicare fee-for-service doesn't offer. For example, some dental benefits, some transportation benefits, some vision benefits. And so that's very attractive. And Medicare Advantage is sponsored by private insurers that have deals with the government to take care of Medicare beneficiaries. And so the Medicare Advantage plans like United or Humana will have specific Medicare Advantage plans and the beneficiaries can go over and take care of that, you know, go there. And you will say, oh, well, that sounds fantastic because Medicare fee for service only pays 80% of a lot of things like dialysis. Medicare Advantage actually pays 100% of the bill. Doesn't it sound great? Well, sometimes when um, patients, Medicare beneficiaries don't read the dotted line, it becomes a problem because they don't realize that there's this major um, deductible that has to be paid. So some of these Medicare Advantage plans may only have a deductible of a, you know, $500, but some of them have a deductible of $6,000. And so patients have to pay that $600, you know, $6,000 before they even get their benefits. So um, it ends up sometimes being a lot more expensive, for example, for our dialysis patients who will definitely uh, go through the entire um, you know, deductible before they get anywhere near getting the benefits for their Medicare um, you know, payment to the dialysis facility kicking in. And then of course, there's the non-Medicare, um, which I mentioned for prevalent dialysis patients nationally, it makes up about 11, 12% of what dialysis organizations um, have in terms of their patients. These are employers, they're in the exchange, private insurance. Um, so that, that's one of the major important non-Medicare sources. And then there's Medicaid only. For example, if you're not eligible for Medicare, um, you might be Medicaid pay, paid for by Medicaid. And who are those patients, for example? Um, undocumented patients in the state of Washington, we have a specific program and uh, we get Medicaid rates. And it might be interesting for you to know that those rates have not changed in Washington state since 2006. You know, we're going on eight, 17 years that they haven't changed and where the average rate we get reimbursed, for example, at uh, Northwest Kidney Center, somewhere around $290 per patient on Medicare fee-for-service, it's closer to $200 per patient for Medicaid. You also have self-pay. Um, very, very few patients are self-pay, meaning that they char they're they paying as charged. Um, and then, you know, we have other groups like the VA, and that is nationally just, just it's over 1% of the population. I hope that gives you a sense of how things are paid for. So, um, you know, in the individual market, when you're talking about commercial insurance versus Medicare, Medicare is the primary payer for about 80% of all patients on dialysis. So clearly, uh, Medicare payment policy makes a huge difference because the individual market a lot of times will follow what Medicare is doing and then base their rates on what Medicare is. So while the number of patients with private insurance is small, I mentioned to you before, like 10% or 12%, of the patients in a dialysis organization are commercial payers. The financial impact um, on both on the insurers and the dialysis organization are huge. So if you think about it, um, this is a quote from, this was published back in JAMA Internal Medicine, took taking a look at um, uh, employer-based commercial insurers. Monthly, monthly, a patient with ESRD costs over $14,000. And that's for all services, okay? And that's 33 times the spend by the enrollees in that same plan that don't have ESRD. So let's say you're a little hospital in Ohio, Marietta, and uh, you've got people in general and you've got one patient with ESRD on maintenance dialysis, for example, um, you know, 14,000 versus 400, uh, it'll, it'll bankrupt your plan potentially. So, um, you know, looking at for all private insurers, not just employer-based insurers, um, it's about $10,000 per month for the dialysis care. The $14,000 is all the care. So the $10,000 a month compared to an estimated payment for the same services by Medicare um, of $3,300. So that's threefold less. And these little pie charts I, I stuck in here, you can think about the commercial as this is the number of patients, but the percent of dollars actually is huge. 
Um, if you look at uh, another publication from January, this is from the Open Network from this year, it's kind of interesting. They look back um, at the eight years between 2012 and 2019 inclusive, and um, they looked at the median growth over these nine years in the pr in private employer based um, insurers versus Medicare. So you can see here this kind of darker, dark green line shows the median private price um, over time, and it has definitely increased on the order of 20 plus percent between 2012 and 2019. $238,000 a year um, with some variability there. And then you have Medicare. Uh, the Medicare base rate has not increased. It has increased over the last three years, but between 2012 and 2020, it didn't increase very much. And those patients you know, are costing under $100,000 per year as of 2019, actually. And um, the one thing you might notice is that there's these orange bars and you're going to say, well, what's that? It says here it's the maximum and minimum Medicare rate. So now you might think, oh, there's a mixed amount, you know, a, a fixed amount of money that you get from Medicare. It's this Medicare rate. Well, no, Medicare rates vary based on a lot of stuff. And so there are some patients that you get um, almost $1,000 per treatment from Medicare. And there are some patients that you get a lot less than that $200 plus per year from Medicare. And you might say, well, what? how is that? I mean, we have all of these patients. How, how does it get calculated? So this is, I thought, a nice pictographic. I'm not, it's a lot of words. It's a busy slide. But the bottom line is there's a lot of stuff that goes into the, the prospective payment system from Medicare. Um, and this is based on 2022. 2023 is actually going to be a little different. But there's a base rate. And that base rate was just published this, well, I guess not this month because it's December now, but in November of 2022 for all of the 2023 year. And that base rate went up 3% from in the 250s to $265 per treatment, but it gets adjusted. So in, we don't get 265 on average, we get closer to 290 plus. Why does Seattle get 290 plus? Because it gets adjusted for things like the wage index, of course, patients and providers uh, cost differently in different geographic areas. So let me just comment not on the details, but on, from a higher, higher perspective, the, the basic um, amount that you're paid for, the hospital wage index for the area, adjust the base rate, and then patient characteristics like age and the body mass index. Um, when you're first starting on dialysis, you get a little bit more money. Um, and then other facility characteristics. If you're in rural areas or in low volume areas, it gets adjusted. And you get more for those because it's more expensive to get resources in those rural areas. If the person is really expensive and use lots of drugs and lots of other supplies, um, a very small percentage of patients can get a high cost outlier payment, for example. And then um, there are a few other adjustments for new drugs and new equipment, and that's what comes up for this payment. So every dialysis organization has to actually calculate this for every single patient for every single month and submit it to Medicare, for example. It's really quite complex. Uh, <laughs> if that's not dizzy enough, uh, let's just go back a few uh, decades. And so with all of that information on how our patients are paid for, um, you know, we all know here that with the dawn of maintenance dialysis, uh, we took a disease that was uniformly lethal and turned it into 90% survivable. We had our life or death committee here in the Seattle area. We initially had our 12 slots. Um, home programs were developed to be able to provide care to more patients. Um, and this is, you know, we had evolution where, where the public recognized that this was a survivable disease. And Actually, it's very interesting how the 1972 entitlement came to be. Um, you know, from Georgetown, there was actually a patient that was brought onto the floor and the nephrologists, there was, it was actually a fellow who was overseen by attending. And on the floor of Congress, there was a dialysis, dem a demonstration of dialysis because they were trying to get Congress to pay for this. Uh, it lasted for all of 15 minutes because the patient probably went into an arrhythmia and they stopped dialysis and the patient was fine and left. So a lot of people in Congress thought that, oh, that's really simple. Oh, and that's very, um, you know, the, the estimates were that it wasn't going to be for a lot of patients. 
Um, so this Medicare entitlement for dialysis was signed into law in 1972 by Nixon, and it went into effect in January of 73, and it basically extends Part A and B if you're eligible for the Social Security benefit. Uh, but even in the first year, the cost far exceeded the expectations by many millions of dollars, and that was back in 1970 plus dollars. Um, so really quick, uh, one slide to talk about a quick uh, movement through history. You had your entitlement. And just of note, there were 40% of all of the patients dialyzing were on home dialysis at that point in time. Uh, and then in 78, there were some changes to the benefit, uh, which actually tried to increase um, peritoneal dialysis rates, not, not so much home hemodialysis rates. Uh, which was, were not super successful. And by 1983, with an updated payment model and a lot of consolidation in the industry, at that point, you had about 14% of patients on home dialysis. Um, there was a modernization act, because uh, really nothing had changed between 83 and 2003. And the whole uh, country recognized that there was incentive because everything was paid for with fee for service to overuse dialysis drugs, for example, at that time, EPO, or, you know, um, which was the only ESA, um, erythropoietin um, was used. It was very, very expensive and dialysis organizations in particular uh, used a lot of it. And um, the legislation that came through decided rather than doing fee for service, they would give a bundle, they, we needed to do a bundled payment um, so there'd be a single payment that was linked to quality measures. At that point in time, you know, there were like 7% of patients on home dialysis, but you also recognize that patients on home dialysis cost a little less. It's, it's on one hand, a little sad to know that it was costs um, that really pushed a lot of um, groups to push home dialysis and that's what it did. So in 2011, the prospective payment system or the bundled system that we do have today that is now over 10 years old, removed the incentive to overuse. They put in an incentive to underuse things like drugs. And uh, with that, you also saw um, an increase, not super rapid, but you know, a substantial increase in home dialysis. So uh, there's always this stuff. I thought it was interesting, again, when you're thinking about payment, um, you know, when you think about the prior payment system, there's actually a negative incentive to start somebody on peritoneal dialysis, but with the new payment system, there was an increased financial um, incentive to do so. So uh, just wanted to put a quick quality timeline in here, thinking about quality and how we're paying for dialysis now. Uh, there was a report from the government talking about the importance of quality payment. You had that legislation that I mentioned, the Affordable Care Act in 2010, then um, put incentive that value-based care is going to be thought about more extensively. You had the bundle that came into effect that I mentioned, quality incentive programs were put forward a year later where you were penalized if you didn't do well on your quality metrics and you put it in there because the bundle incentive incented low, you know, lower amounts of care potentially because you got the same amount of money no matter what you did, whereas the quality incentive program put in for you know, uh, some hopefully some um, restraints on uh, making sure that there was high quality care provided, otherwise it would be financial penalties. And with, the, with that, thinking about value-based care and the Affordable Care Act, things like um, ESRD seamless care organizations were put into effect as a pilot program for five years where if we saved money and gave high quality, you could share in savings. Um, and I'm going to talk about one slide uh, about the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative, which is probably going to change. It's already changing a little bit in terms of payment for dialysis from the government and probably will do so more in the future. Uh, this is just showing that uh, we were one of the ESCAs, which was the first um, pilot program or that was a subspecialty pilot program for um, accountable care organizations in this country. Um, but that was really focused on dialysis only. Um, it's important for our patients overall. They don't just land in dialysis. It's important to think of how value is brought to their care, both from um, a quality perspective, but also from a financial perspective so we can afford to, do, to pay for all of our patients uh, to think about their care throughout the whole spectrum of kidney disease and the care needed for our patients, not just in maintenance dialysis, but also um, upstream and downstream. So 
Um, you know, why did the government uh, in 2019 suddenly decide to talk about, um, you know, putting into place a more holistic view of kidney care? Um, because kidney disease has been common, increasing, deadly, and expensive, you know, for many, many years and recognized. Um, incentives were not well in line, but why in 2019? Well, it was personal. Um, and I put the picture of these two people up here because Adam Bowler and Alex Azar were both personally um, affected in various ways by kidney disease. Alex Azar's father actually was on maintenance dialysis, had terrible experiences, and then got transplanted. And so sometimes you need personal experiences um, at the highest levels of government to have something happen. This was when the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative or the ESCO 2.0 was, was signed into law in July. Uh, this is a picture I took from the audience. Uh, and it's probably the most comprehensive governmental policy initiative ever proposed related to kidney health. It introduced value-based payment models to improve quality of life and catalyzed innovation um, and coordinated regulatory payment and policies. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I wanna fast forward um, to segue back to Lauren again. And with one last slide before I do, I just wanna talk a little bit about how dialysis organizations survive. Um, so recall that no matter what the dialysis, you know, the profit status is, no matter what you think about various dialysis organizations, whether it's Fresenius and DeVita, Northwest Kidney Centers, other you know, small dialysis organizations or nonprofit dialysis organizations, we serve a very vulnerable population. There are you know, well over half a million patients um, that require maintenance dialysis to survive in this country. And you know, in the last year, 2020, um, when we had good data, there's actually a decrease in that population for the first time ever, really as a result of COVID. Um, a lot of that data is gonna play out, but I think that when we see the data for 2021 and 2022, we'll see that, that po the population probably isn't expanding because again of COVID, but at, as we move past the pandemic into an endemic COVID world, the population will probably increase again. And no matter your profit status, um, you have to remember that in order for us to serve this population, we need to not be negative in our margin, you know, no margin, no mission. And um, Medicare fee-for-service covers less than the actual cost of dialysis. <laughs> so how do you cover cost? Uh, well, yeah, commercial payers are charged, as you saw from the data I presented earlier, you know, somewhere sometimes between five to six time Medicare rates, you know, let's say the average payment, as I mentioned, was $265 for 2023. Yeah, some commercial payers are paying $900, $1,200, even $2,000 per treatment if you're, in, you know, needing to pay one dialysis organization because they're the only one that can be in your network. And this is where Marietta had a real issue because they really only had one group to pay. Uh, and by the way, um, there are reports from MedPAC, um, the Policy Advi Advisory Committee to Medicare, that um, Medicaid, um, that sometimes is the safety net is substantially less even than Medicare. So it really is the commercial insurers that cover only 10%, 12% of all dialysis um, patients that really end up paying and supporting and, and helping dialysis organizations survive. I think that that's crazy um, when I think about it outside. So again, our psychedelic slide, and I'm gonna go hand this back to Lauren. Perfect. So going back to Ohio and, you know, getting more a little bit more into the granular details of what was actually the, going on with the case. So, you know, as we've kind of talked about, Marietta had no in-network dialysis provider. Um, as part of their benefits. And so rather they they had um, a, a different tier benefit where they capped the amount that they would pay per dialysis session at 125% of the base Medicare rate um, with patients being responsible for about 30% of that in coinsurance. So overall, the, the, the average amount that Marietta would be paying of the actual um, base Medicare rate would be around 87%. And they were paying this rather than having to pay what, um, what DeVita's customary charges were, which again, like uh, you know, Susanna's talking about is you know, significantly higher. 
And so what you have to remember is that Marriott, again, was a self-funded, you know, employee, you know, small employee um, health um, benefit plan. And so Davida, obviously, you know, found this uh, suit because they were not getting paid what they felt that they were due. And, and they sued really on um, the, the, the premise that this had violated the Medicare Secondary Payer Act. And there's really two important components to the Medicare Secondary Payment Act that I think are important to, to really highlight and play the, the major points of this case. So um, the first is that, um, you know, you're not that uh, these private insurers um, are not supposed to differentiate in benefits um, that it provides to individuals based off of whether they have end-stage kidney disease or not on the basis of the fact that they have this disease or that they need dialysis or some other proxy that hasn't been defined at the time. And that also that this, um, they cannot, an insurance company cannot take into account that this um, individual could be eligible for uh, Medicare. Um, and then the, the third point that they make is that, um, you know, the, really what's called the disparate impact theory, saying that, you know, discriminating against patients who get outpatient dialysis is essentially, you know, and, and not offering that benefit is essentially discriminating against patients with end-stage kidney disease. And so with that in mind, um, you know, first this went to the district court, which had agreed with Marietta. It then progressed to the um, the Sixth uh, Circuit Court of Appeals, which actually reversed it and agreed with, with, with uh, DeVita that this um, did uh, differentiate as far as its impact on end-stage kidney disease and finally went to the Supreme Court. So next, uh, next slide. And the Supreme Court ruled in favor of, of Marietta and against DeVita. And, and the crux of why the Supreme Court decided to rule in favor of um, of Marietta really comes down to the, the concept and the notion that um, the Medicare Secondary Payer Act is not a traditional anti-discrimination act or statute, but really it's a coordination of benefits. And so when you look back at the text, it really says you, you're not differentiating in terms of the benefits offered to patients with end-stage kidney disease and not. And so it, um, they felt like the Medicare Secondary Payment Act was not violated because all patients, whether they have end-stage kidney disease or not, uh, had the same low-level benefit. And so one of the questions I had in my mind was, well, wait, if that's not discriminating against patients, you know, what, what would that actually look like? <laughs> and thankfully, um, for me, they, they explained what it would look like if, if a um, insurance uh, plan was discriminating. And so that would be if they terminated coverage for patients who developed end-stage kidney disease, if they increased the de deductibles, you know, for patients with end-stage kidney disease, or if they covered fewer services. Okay, so all patients have the same services, whether they needed it or not, right? So not discrimination. And then the second point that I actually thought was, was probably a stronger argument is that the Medicare Secondary Payment Act um, does not uh, mandate a specific level of coverage. So when you look at the text, they don't say you have to have some base amount of payment for dialysis. So you're not even required to, you know, match the Medicare reimbursement rate. You could pay more or less. Um, and, you know, what's interesting too is that, um, and I think is, is, is a strong point, is that they, they felt that the courts is not the right place to just to um, decide what constitutes an adequate level of coverage because the argument is going to be if the Supreme Court is deciding what is an at, you know an adequate amount of coverage for dialysis, you know that opens the floodgates that people with many different conditions can then sue and say, hey, this level of coverage for my heart disease or my cancer is not adequate. And so by opening these floodgates, we're going to have the courts who are not the best people, um, to decide this, to, to make this decision. So it's interesting. So obviously the minority dissents, uh, the two were um, Justice uh, Kagan and Justice um, Sotomayor, and um, they really had a couple points that, that that need. And the first is that they really agreed with Davida that, that, in, that dialysis is a near perfect proxy for um, patients with end-stage kidney disease, outpatient dialysis, excuse me, and that, you know, the vast majority of patients who are on outpatient dialysis, you know, it's 99% on outpatient dialysis have end-stage kidney disease, um, 
And, you know, of patients who have end-stage kidney disease, almost all of them, you know, unless they get a, a, um, a preemptive transplant, will undergo dialysis. And so the argument is that if a plan singles out dialysis for a disfavored coverage, that this differentiates in the benefits that it would provide between individuals that have end-stage kidney disease and those do not. And so of my N of one of reading Supreme Court cases, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes um, from Justice Kagan, which is, a tax on yarmulkes remains a tax on Jews, even if friends of other faiths might occasionally don one in a bar mitzvah. Which I think is, you know, real, I think a compelling argument saying that, you know, not covering dialysis really almost exclusively affects patients with, who, uh, with end stage kidney disease because almost nobody else will need it. And then the second point that they argue is that um, by siding with Marietta, this actually really violates the intent of the Medicare Secondary Payment Act, because this was, again, this was not introduced at the time of 1972 when the initial Medicare entitlement was in, uh, was uh, first uh, provided, but was actually introduced in 1982 when the government realized the increasing costs of providing dialysis. And so part of it was trying to kind of make sure that insurance co companies would cover some of these costs. Um, and we would be responsible for it. And so by agreeing with Marietta, you're allowing these insurance companies to essentially have the framework to avoid paying for patients um, on dialysis. The next slide. So who are the winners and the losers of this case? And so this is the, the overall you know, picture of, of kind of at first light, you know, how do we decide who, who benefits? And I think that the clear benefit obviously is, is private insurance companies. And I think you can make the argument that, you know, is it fair for small insurance companies to have to pay whatever list price that DeVita or Fresenius charges them and that that's fair? Probably not. But but this, um, you know, this decision really laid out the roadmap for private insurers to shift the cost of patients with end-stage kidney disease onto Medicare. Um, you know, <laughs> The clear losers, so government finances. <laughs> so, you know, undoubtedly this will uh, push more patients onto Medicare, which as taxpayers, we will be responsible for. Now, I think many of us think like, hey, we want our tax dollars to be used for good. We want to support our patients. You know, that's great, but there's, there is the concern that this could, better, you know, this could um, bankrupt uh, CMS. Um, interestingly enough, um, and we don't have to talk about too much, the, the government actually um, filed an amicus brief and argued on the side of, of Marietta uh, in the case, um, but, um, you know, kind of understanding that this was going to increase uh, the financial burden on the government. Um, and then certainly dialysis organizations are, you know, the clear losers for this. And I think that, um, you know, part of the issue is that this, again, you know, while one small employee healthcare plan may not bankrupt dial, you know, these dialysis organizations as a whole, that if you have the large uh, insurance companies now also shifting their care to Medicare, which we know does not cover the costs of, you know, complete costs of, of uh, providing dialysis, that again, no margin, no mission, that um, these that these dialysis organizations are at risk of not being able to provide care. And, and so, you know, one of the questions that I had, and I think it would be interesting to see if anybody has any thoughts, is like, you know, how much should dialysis cost and, and who should pay, right? I mean, what's the right amount of profit to, for a, a, a dialysis organization to make? You know, is it to break even? Well, I mean, you know, Davida and Fresenius provide the vast majority of of dialysis, you know, provide dialysis to the vast majority of patients across the United States. So if they decide they want to go out of business, like we're in big trouble, right? So um, there was one, you know, one group that was not on the last slide, which is really the patients, because I know that there are going to be people in this audience who say, you know, heck, I don't care about the finances. I want to go to clinic and I just want to provide the best care for patients. And so I think it's important to think about how this is going to affect patients. And so, you know, the, one of the big concerns is that, you know, the dialysis centers that are most at risk for, um, for being financially affected by this are the smaller standalone dialysis organizations that do not have the same economies of scale and purchasing powers to be able to absorb the decreased profits that they would make. And so this is disproportionately going to affect 
marginalized patients and, and patients, uh, marginalized communities, as well as rural communities. And one of the fears is that, you know, if you consolidate dialysis organizations further, you may make patients travel further to their dialysis centers. And we know that increased transportation distance is associated with increased mortality for dialysis patients. Um, you know, furthermore, the risk is for increased out-of-pocket costs. So again, you know, with Marietta, one of the issues is that, you know, because this was a out-of-network benefit, that while, you know, Marietta would provide some of the coverage of the cost of dialysis, that, you know, it was so small compared to what DeVita was covering that, you know, the, the patients could be responsible for what's called balanced billing, billing or making up that difference. Um, of the cost of what DeVito was charging versus what the insurance company was paying. And so, you know, had it been in network, that would not have been a risk to the patients. Um, there's also the risk that, you know, if your private insurance does not cover it, but you want to try to get, you know, Medicare to help pay and offset some of those costs that you'd have to pay, you know, an additional deductible in addition to whatever you're paying for your private insurance. But, you know, I think that the other two and the two, you know, points on the side is, you know, what happens to patients when they lose their private insurance? Because I think it's easy to think about, hey, Medicare is great. It's going to cover the patients. No problem. But, you know, as uh, Suzanne already mentioned, you know, Medicare doesn't cover everything. So it doesn't cover dental. Um, you know, it also doesn't cover all physicians. So imagine for many of our patients in the, you know, the traumatic time where they just get this new health diagnosis and change their health status. And now they have to switch over to new doctors who don't know their story. I mean, that's that's pretty traumatic for them. And so you know, that's one of the reasons why that Medicare Secondary Payment Act of having that coverage for up to 30 months could be helpful because it allowed for a more gradual and gentle transition for these patients to, to settle into their dialysis. Um, there's also concerns that you know, just being on Medicare will limit patients' abilities to get transplant, which is something I think many of us feel very passionate about. And then, you know, finally, you know, this affects more than just our patients, but also affects their families. And so you think about how many of us uh, may be the, you know, primary holder for our insurance and that we have dependents, children, spouses, other folks who rely on us for their insurance coverage. And so if we lose that because we are forced to go into Medicare, that this will affect our families. And so that's, you know, one of the big, big risks of this. So I think one of the reasons why I think this is an important thing for all of us to care about whether or not you care about how much DeVita makes or, you know, how much the government pays is how is this going to affect our patients? So I think that kind of moves us on to what do we do? Yeah, I think you just cover that so well. And just you know, back to Marietta, I want to go through these. I think I have like four more slides. Go through it really quickly because I want to make sure we have time for um, some robust discussion around this. Because you know, employ employer-based insurers really do see this, and I'll, I'll say it with air quotes as a goldmine. I have seen so many um, webinars already advertising how you, as an employer-based insurer, can look back to Marietta and change things for 2023 in your plan. For example, so it's not just Marietta. Um, word has spread like wildfire in the, um, you know, private insurer community um, that that this is a potential way to go forward. So we'll see what plays out and to what degree um, commercial insurers um, from employer based pro, um, programs um, cover, do cover or don't cover to the same degree where they have before. You know, think about all of the stakeholders. So you know, regulators, um, the CMS rates are the issue. I mean, again, this could bunk, bankrupt Medicare, um, but, you know, how can we advocate for more reasonable rates, which is what Lauren was alluding to, you know, what is the right way? What is the right amount of money that we should, one should be paid for dialysis and how can this be level set in some way? Very interestingly, and it hasn't even been put on paper yet, but um, we've heard that some legislation, which I'll mention uh, before we finish up, that is being proposed um, to actually confirm that Medicare secondary payer is something that has to be um, observed and that would potentially be passed by Congress. Bills have to be scored as either a pay for or um, pay to. And so bills that are proposing new legislation such as firming up Medicare secondary payer, if it's a 
pay for for the government, maybe that is something that will be taken up. And so we just talked a lot about how this um, SCOTUS decision could really bankrupt Medicare. Well, ironically, the government is saying that it is actually going to, um, to, to firm up Medicare's secondary payer is actually going to cost the government more money. You, you must, to me, that sounds crazy. And to you as an audience, that must sound crazy. But they're quoting the, the, the actuaries from the government are quoting other issues outside of Medicare in terms of how taxes will be affected for people who will no longer um, be paying for employer-based insurance on um, non-tax dollars so that the government would be losing the tax dollars that people would be paying ironically. We'll see how that plays out. So the legislators are being presented with this legislative fix but it's unclear um, how this is going to play out in terms of how the bill is scored. And dialysis organizations, as Lauren mentioned, um, you know, is uh, are we'll see how things go. Obviously, the, the large dialysis organizations um, were very disappointed because this was Marietta versus DeVita. Fresenius feels the same way. There's a nonprofit kidney care alliance that's actually taken no position on this. Uh, and why would you say they take no position? Well, you know, we've gotten ourselves in a pickle, I think, in the dialysis environment. And, you know, we, we do charge commercial insurers relatively unsustainable rates, or very high rates. Um, so DeVita was charging Marietta very high ra rates, um, and we need to find a fix. So, you know, our industry is not blame free here. Um, you know, so the proposed fix, why fix this? The cost of losing private insurers rates would be devastating in terms of the ability to provide dialysis. Uh, this legislative fix is unofficially being called the DeVita bill. It doesn't help the case of the dialysis providers. Many of you may hearken back to John Oliver's piece on uh, payment and dialysis organizations. If any of you are interested in this and haven't watched it, you should look it up on YouTube. I think it's a very compelling case about um, what is, has gone on in the past in terms of dialysis and payment. Um, you know, it would be very, very minor language to um, firm up the Medicare secondary payer, um, uh, you know, uh, as legislation. Um, but again, um, not all dialysis providers are uniformly behind this. My personal biggest concerns was, was something that Lauren mentioned, is that families lose coverage. And if you think about how our patients are so vulnerable, you know, how are they supported? And they're, some of their firmest supporters are their families, their carers, their caregivers. Um, so the bottom line, you know, is it's not clear how to sustain the dialysis payment um, if we do not find some way forward, you know, could it be value-based care arrangements? Hard to know, uh, the future will tell. But there is, uh, you know, the most important thing is for those of us who can to advocate. Not everybody is, um, should be advocating, but any way you can advocate on behalf of your patients is a good thing. Certainly this is something that's been important to me personally. Uh, and all of you can participate in the various ways that you find relevant to you. Um, participating in Kidney Community Advocacy Days, thinking about how to get out there to support patients, um, thinking about all of our organizations and um, you know, the work they do for policy and advocacy um, overall. So um, with this, you know, these are just questions I'm putting out there. I wanna open it up. Lauren and I wanna take on um, questions. You know, what does this mean to your patients? How should we take action and by my, what means and what's the most effective way forward? Um, how do we keep apprised of this in the future? And you know, should we be training people, nephrologists, for example? It would be a very small portion, but you know, we, we need to have advocates in our space and by what means would we do this? Um, so we just wanna thank all of you for listening over this last 50 minutes or so. Um, and there are many, many, many more people to thank. Um, but with that, I'm going to end the slideshow and stop screen sharing and uh, want to get back to hopefully taking questions from all of you. Um, thank you so much. Thanks. I see some questions um, on the slide. Let's see where the ones start. ADLs. Uh, oh, there's some 
commentary on the oh this is believe differentiating okay so matt's question did the plan have 30 percent coinsurance for other non-dialysis care or lower level of coinsurance presumably it was the same because that's the basis but i don't know that for sure lauren do you know that yeah i mean i think that's the hard part that was one of the arguments that was that was made was that if any other condition had lower payment levels that this would not be discrimination against patients with end-stage kidney disease. Um, when I listened to the C-SPAN, I, I didn't actually hear them mention any other conditions that were covered at a lower level. So I think dialysis may have been the, the one benefit. Yeah, and and I, I was reading Matt's and then I'm glad, Raj, that you put that in because I was about to comment on that. He will probably make over $100 million um, with all of his comp. So um there's a lot of incentive comp um a lot of these for-profit providers the primary way that um, the executives are reimbursed are primarily by incentive comp so you know they have their base salary which might be x but then they might get 10x in terms of uh, additional compensation it's it's really um nauseating in in my opinion so that is tough um i think this is being recorded so please uh, this is just my own personal opinion it's not the opinion of other dialysis organizations such as northwest kidney centers but that's a tough that's a that's a tough thing um you know what's the right i think the bottom line is you know where's right price and so let me just read some more of the comments here um Weiling lao commented maintaining 30 percent coinsurance ends up being a huge financial burden for dialysis patients um ends up discriminating against lower income patients that certainly can be the case um and yoshio you thought commercial insurers negotiate payment rates for, yes within network providers and so uh, they do but if you happen to be out of network then the employer-based plan can just uh say we're going to pay this you know davina might charge a very hard, high amount and this is where all this is the tension here. This is exactly the tension. Uh, so I guess if I were a commercial insurer, why would I pay six to eight times Medicare rates for the same service? Well, if you're an insurance plan, you there are actually requirements from a governmental perspective. You have to provide care. So you have to provide some in-network um, dialysis care, for example, GI care, oncology care. And so you have to have contracts with hospitals, dialysis providers, et cetera. So you have to have some, um, some contracts. This is a great uh, question. Um, we have a C. Jason perspective and press on this, Wei Ling, says Raj. Um, and then the reply is fab. Um, great, Raj, thank you so much. I don't know if you have any other comments you want to make on that. I share your disdain of the market place that is so distorted. And I think the important thing to notice here is, you know, why is this not in other fields? Well, think about it. Like in the hospital, you know, it's not 80 plus percent um, covered by Medicare, you know, as the pay, pay source and 10 percent Medicaid with only 10 percent commercial. You know, it, it's 50 percent commercial. So there's less of a, you know, less of a discrepancy. You can have less of a discrepancy between payment rates. And this is the tension. So it's ironic, but it's part of because of, you know, what happened back in the 70s covering everybody. But then because we're covering any, everybody and the payment from Medicare has not kept pace with inflation. So if you look at what Medicare paid back in the 1980s, it's not all that different from what they're paying in 2022, 2023. It hasn't kept pace with inflation. And this is where this discrepancy between payers has happened. So um, it's very interesting if you look at the equivalent and, and went with inflation, you wouldn't be getting an average of $265 per treatment nationally for Medicare. You'd be getting a whole, whole, whole lot more, which would cover ironically. And these are the conversations we have at the level of advocacy um, on a very frequent basis. I think, you know, one other point to make is, in my mind, of, of what makes this really interesting is when you read the history of how the Medicare um, entitlement was passed in 1952, there's actually a really great uh, book chapter from uh, Richard Reddick that kind of talks about how 
you know, dialysis was, you know, singled out as, you know, this Medicare entitlement. It's the only condition in stage kidney disease is the only condition that has this entitlement. And part of it was, you know, putting in context of the time where they were expecting to have, you know, either catastrophic insurance pass soon or have nationalized um, health care. And so, um, you know, in the cost of the time were grossly underestimated, um, both, you know, the number of patients affected, it also didn't include patients over the age of 65 in their cost analysis, because they were already being included in Medicare, which is interesting to think about, right, because so many of our patients now are over the age of 65. Um, so, I mean, it's just like the history of it and figuring out how we ended up in this, in this pickle is, is, is super fascinating. Uh, one question for Matt, and then I'd like to switch over just in the last minute um, if others have questions for um, a ball after that. Thanks, uh, Kate. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to talk about here. I mean, uh, just a couple of points. One is I think this case also exposes what a challenging proposition the principle of co-insurance is rather than co-pays. Um, and it just exposes patients to enormous liability for potentially very high amounts of money. And we could talk more about that. And then I, the second thing, I mean, you guys have said this, but I, I just think this case really exposes sort of what a house of cards payment for dialysis is in terms of its reliance on Medicare. I mean, it's crazy to think that a business can operate where you're losing money on 80 to 90% of the patients. Um, and, you know, it just seems like the solution, as Suzanne has said, is we have to get Medicare to pay appropriately for dialysis care. And I think we as nephrologists are also exposed to this house of cards as well, recalling that an enormous percentage of many nephrologist salaries is based on dialysis payments from Medicare. And if that payment was to not go up over time and was in fact to go down, we would have a problem. I'll just stop there. I'll just make the one comment that to answer Steve's question. Um, ever since AKI was, there was a hole, a donut hole where AKI wasn't covered, but ever since 2017, when it was all of the prospective payment rules every year, they, they essentially have been covering AKI patients requiring dialysis in outpatient units at the same rate as Medicare fee for service for maintenance dialysis, Steve. And it's a very small percentage. Thank you, everybody. Lauren and I really appreciate it. And it was actually really fun for me. I hope it wasn't too onerous for Lauren to work together to present this together. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Clearly, we could, we could talk about this for a while and hope there's more discussion offline.